four twenty three to thirty one. And uh, this is the ESV. That's probably a different version, but we'll read in rotation. I'll start with verse twenty three. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. All together. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Let's pray. Father, at this time, please speak to your people. Would you reveal your goodness to them, your perfect plans for them? Help them understand that they need to pray not out of an obligation, not out of duty, but that prayer is meant to fulfill the deepest crevices of their needs, their desires, their wantings, their brokenness, everything. Uh, you can commune and talk to them through prayer. Father, I know that you love us and you desire to communicate with us through prayer and through your word and through the spirit. Father, because I believe that you are a missional God, you will reach out to people here right now and you will talk to them in the midst of their exact context that I have no way of discerning, that I have no power to understand. I have no way to understand how deep a hurt is or how deep an addiction is or how deep a pain or a struggle is. But Father, only you can do that. So Father, please be delighted to speak to your people today. Father, do not let me be a distraction to these people. Father, cover me that you yourself would be shown here and your word would be deeply celebrated and people would have a deep, immense desire to pray to the Father that they uh, are coming to know. Father, we thank you for this day. We know that you will receive all glory and honor. We ask that you would just help us celebrate that and enjoy that as we have communion together in the midst of this worship service. Father, we honor you and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll have a seat. God is good. And all the time. Just a quick um, exercise before we start anything. Um, you all had that experience when you were young as children that you're uh, driving through a tunnel and you try to hold your breath as long as you can until that uh, tunnel finished. Let's try that right now. Um, so let's see who can hold their breath the longest. And uh, 30 seconds will be probably average, 45 longer, and one minute means you're really, really competitive. Uh, but let's try. Uh, so hold your breath, deep breath. Ready? Okay, one more time. Go. Try to make eye contact and make the other person smile, give away their breath. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> you guys can continue. Guys who are really competitive, please, uh, our church doesn't need a lawsuit, so uh, <laughs> finish when you're done. Okay. Now, as we do this, um, you will understand and see uh, that after 30 seconds, breath becomes uh, a, a deep internal signal that you really need to focus on. You're like, I need to breathe. I need to breathe. And 45 seconds is impossible not to breathe. But here's the thing. Uh, a lot of us... <laughs> Kind of scared. <laughs> but a lot of us, uh, we come to church looking exactly like this. And you haven't been breathing for the whole week. You haven't been praying. 
and your face is becoming blue and a lot of your bodily functions are dying down uh no wonder a lot of you are so like strict and so like you know a lot of pent up like strictness in your body because that's you know the signal of a dying body because you haven't been breathing and you know for the christian for the christian prayer is like the ferrari engine uh that that a ferrari needs but you know you, you open the trunk uh, the the hood of a lot of christians today and you find that they're running on what maybe lawnmower engines right a lot of you have perfectly good hardware that christ has given to you by his perfect grace but then you open the hood and you find that there's a lawnmower engine and you're not operating the way that you can you can actually go away faster you can go stronger you can be more equipped but at the same time because you're running on a deficit engine because you're not praying there is no power. We're looking at the book of Acts to look at the, the arsenal, the weapons of the church, and how we can function in today's society as a living church that continues to do God's will. Last week, we looked at the power of the church granted through the Holy Spirit, and today we're going to look, look at basically the engine of what keeps a church um, operating, which is prayer. Now, I, all of you know, I know, I've heard too many sermons, you've heard too many sermons about the importance of prayer. But has it changed our lives in the way that we pray? Maybe not. Maybe we're still getting there. Or maybe you don't pray at all. I know uh, some Christians who haven't prayed in a year, entire year, a few months. Some people just do the, the breakfast and the lunch dinners, uh, dinner prayers. And it's, it's showing that we're not breathing enough. There's no power in our lives. But despite the fact that we all know how important prayer is, we don't do it. And a lot of times the sermon is pitched this way. I, I try to get you to feel guilty about not praying enough. You know what's going to happen when you don't pray? There's going to be always a sense of clogged up guilt. You're going to be powerless. You're going to not enjoy the Christian life. And uh, all these all sorts of bad things that you've been warned about. And so you're trying to be forced into prayer. Being forced into prayer. But today I want to try a different way. Uh, St. Augustine, I believe this is his story. I know the verse that he picked up and read was a different verse in, in Romans 13. But St. Augustine was a sex addict around 16, age 16. He was sleeping with a mistress. His Christian mother was very, you know, always praying for him. Um, but he couldn't give up a sexually promiscuous life until um, later he read Romans 13, 13 through, 13 through 14. And basically he said, a light shone into my heart. And then after that he read, apparently, uh, apparently this is him, he read in the book of Matthew, uh, the Beatitudes, and basically Jesus was saying, blessed are the what? The pure in heart for what? What's the, what's the prize of being pure in heart? They shall see God. And Augustine was in agony after reading that verse, not because he heard of the hell that was waiting for him when he didn't trust in Jesus, or he didn't hear about the difficulties in life that was awaiting him if he didn't place his trust in the gospel. He was looking at what he was, what he was missing out on. FOMO. He was missing out on the ability to see the creator of the universe who is most beautiful. And that was what caused him to actually groan in agony so that he desired and needed the gospel that changed his life. And that's the approach I want to take to you today. FOMO. Fear of missing out on a life that is totally empowered by prayer. What are you missing out on? What beautiful things, what powerful things, what exhilarating, breathtaking things are awaiting you, right? Every day, waking up in San Jose, uh, going to the same workplace, meeting the same boss, going through the same stress, having the same fight with your spouse, and there's, you're losing that sense of adventure and power and, 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 and knowing what you're living for. But it's all here. Usually I would say, you know, there's gold nuggets in the scripture passage that we're reading today. Today I want to tell you, we have an engine in today's passage that gives your life power, direction, meaning all the things that are needed to complete your identity in Christ is all here. So I want to show you what you're missing out on. And there's eight points. Every point, very, very short. Don't worry. And you're not supposed to memorize it all. Every point wants to, I want every point to make you go, I want that and need that. Why am I not praying? Why am I missing out? Why have I thought of prayer as a fairy tale? 
And so I want to show you what's possible. The life that we can live, the life that is promised to us through the Holy Spirit, it's available in prayer. And so let's look through today's word. We're going to go verse by verse, and every verse has a beautiful um, uh, commission from Jesus telling us that this is what's available in, in prayer. So let's look. Verse 23. Uh, let's just go over verse by verse. So when they were released, that's the first part I want to focus on. When they were released, what, what's the first thing that they do? They go and pray. So what were they released from? They were released from prison because the same people that had crucified Jesus, um, the uh, the the Sanhedrin, the uh, the Pharisees, and the uh, teachers of the law, they were they were all gathered and they had captured who Peter and uh, John, and they were telling them, okay, I see that you're doing miracles again. After, even though we killed Jesus, you're preaching in his name and you're he uh, healing people. And so let me tell you not to preach in this name again. So they forbade them from preaching uh, the name of the Lord and they sent them out. And so um, they actually were released from prison. So the first thing that they do after being released from prison, let's think about this, from a San Josean lens, from an American westernized lens, let's say I went to prison, okay, so I'm just going to kind of like, you know, deprecate myself, I'll lower myself. So I went to prison, let's say I went to prison, and the officials tell me, you can't preach anymore. What do you think I would do? Knowing myself, here's probably what I'll do. I'll come here, I'll gather the board, I'll gather the deacons, and I'll probably hire consultants and legal advisors and tell them to come to us and give us good, legal, safe advice that tells us what we can do from this point on. What are our options? Can we preach given this law or given this protection? Can we continue to do this? And that's myself. That's what I'm like. These people were not stupid. But the first thing that they do, they don't gather a committee. They don't form teams. They don't ask for advice. They gather with friends and they start what? Praying. The first benefit that we're missing out on is a life led by God's power and not your common sense and not your powers, not your abilities. That's the first thing that we're missing out on. Why are we so stressed and we look stressed all the time? Why is it? Because you've been living your life. And the only resources that you've had available is yourself. That's why we're always so tired. Because I'm not enough. Because my advisors are not enough. Because the people who speak, speak the truth to me are not wise enough. And so it's not enough what I have. And the greatest sign of a truly satisfied Christian is one who is satisfied in the ability of God to lead him forward to the future. And therefore he rests knowing that he has never been capable, but God is. That's the life that we're missing out on, a stress-free life. Not stress in the sense that everything will be perfect, not that kind of stress-free, but stress-free because God ha has everything under his control and you can rely upon him and you don't have to form committees. You don't have to be trained in leadership and management and self-help and find out how to make your life better. That's the gift of the Christian who prays. Sufficiency in God's power. EPC, you have deep spiritual problems. And do you know where they come from? You have deep spiritual problems that come from, everyone listen to me, the genius of Satan. The genius of Satan planted a problem in your life. And what's even worse is you don't want to be victorious over that issue because your flesh also desires, desires it. It's not about how smart you are or how capable you are. That's not the issue. You want it, and therefore you will not be able to overcome the issues that Satan throws at you because they're so appealing and attractive. How will you overcome this? Pride, right? You want to be you want to feel better about yourself. And so when Satan says, you know, here's another opportunity to lift yourself up above the competition, we're gonna all go for it. Why? Because you not only you don't want to fight against it, you want you want it. So how can we actually overcome the struggles of daily life? It's only when God gives you his spirit. It's only when you pray and you are given an objective look about what your life is all about. And then that's when you start desiring what God desires. And then that's when you start fighting sin. So on their release, as soon as they were released, they started praying. And here's the thing for us. As soon as something happens... Don't focus on your emotions. 
they will be there, but don't focus on it. Don't give it lordship, okay? Don't focus on the committees around you, the people around you who give you advice. Don't start calling everywhere. People who pray first and then call, they will receive good, honest advice. But people who don't pray first and they call because they're trying to survive off of that advice, I promise you, God will let that, not let that advice be healing because he wants you to rely upon him first. And you've tried this. You've been judged. You've been, you know, um, you've been pierced by people who have condemned you when you asked out and reached out for help. Pray first. That's the moral. Pray first. Upon release, upon whatever that you're returning from, pray first. That's what God is desiring of your life. UPC, pray right now. That's the best piece of advice I can give you. Pray right now, just do it. It doesn't matter how organized your thoughts are. It doesn't matter how holy you present yourself to be. It doesn't matter how unprepared you are. Just do it. Pray. God will take care of the rest. He can make sense out of your unorganized thoughts. Let's just do uh, something, a kinetic exercise. So, uh, okay, follow me. What you need right now upon release, upon your your your... Uh, upon the issues of your life. What you need right now doesn't come from, follow me, doesn't come from here, okay, point here. Doesn't come from here, your strength. Doesn't come from here, follow me, your hands. It doesn't come from your abilities. It comes from where? That's what you need. The solution to your life isn't from all of our faculties. It comes from you getting down on your knees and trusting in a God who can do it all. Amen? Amen. So upon release, the first thing, the first response, not the Christian's last response, the first, pray. Amen? Great. Verse 24, uh, we go on. And here's what they say. They went to their friends, and Scripture records, and when they heard this, they raised their voices together. And we see a lot of repetition. We see a lot of uh, almost superfluous emphasis here. What, what is this talking about? What is this trying to show? They, those who pray, let me just um, give it out to you right now. Those who pray experience what? True spiritual friendship and community. You might think it's the other way around. Only true spiritual friendship results in prayer. That's one way to think about it. But here, I believe, prayer cements a good fellowship, a good friendship. Let's go over this. The word friends here, um, it said, uh, they went to their friends. The word here is hoi idioi. Um, basically, in Greek, it means their own people. So it's like, it's not just their friends. It's like people who have their backs, right? Their people, their comrades, people who are united by mind and heart for the same purpose. So basically, Peter and John, they went back to who? Their own people, the people of faith. They went back to their life group, in other words. Hint, hint. They went back to their life group to be filled with what? A communal sense of prayer. The word here, next, the next word is together. The word together is homo thymaden. And in the strong sense, if you interpret this in a very literal strong sense, it means of one accord. What does that mean? So my people who share the same thoughts and the same intentions and the same goals and dreams that I have, that's what it means to, have, to be of one accord. And so I, I, I hope you're thirsting for this. I hope that you see the value of what a group of people who are your own and you belong to them, they belong to you. If you hurt, I hurt, I am you, you are me. And then they have what? The same accord. This is so valuable. Husbands and wives sleep in the same bed thinking two different thoughts. Wanting two different things. That's why they're always fighting. Different desires. Even husband and wife, they are not of one accord. But in Christ, those who pray in one mind and one heart, they can be of one accord. Why am I so like emphasizing this? You know, look at the repetition. They went to their friends when they heard, when they heard, they raised their voices all together. It's like, man, no wonder Peter and John went to these people because they're the same people. They are one family. And there is no separating such people who are tied and cemented together by prayer. Many of you are thirsty for deep and meaningful and real relationships. You're looking for a soulmate still. Even if you're married, you're still looking for a soulmate. A Jonathan looking for David. A David looking for Jonathan. And 
a lot of you say, you know, I don't need prayer for this. I don't need Christian community, so I'll try to replicate that out in society. So you go out, you have a few beers, you talk about golf or whatever the next fad is or, you know, sports. You talk about that and you feel like an empty husk inside because there is no one accord. The smallest political issue and you'll fight. The smallest family issue that you touch upon because you care about that person, you'll fight because you are not of one accord. You are not their people. They are not your people. But you desire this so. You desire this so much. Only in Christ, when prayer cements and bonds together a group of people to have one mind. How is that one mind possible? Because you try to have one mind with your spouses, but has it ever happened? No. But why is it possible in prayer? Because the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God and he implants it into each of the people who are praying of one accord and they are of one accord from that point on. In prayer, you can find real, real, real friendship. And those of you are, who are looking in the wrong places, you are looking, you must be looking in the direction of people who know the gospel, who knows what it means to partake in pain and agony together and pray with one accord. That's what you're looking for. Heartfelt, single-minded, anguished prayer coming from a uh, prayer cements a real spiritual spiritual friendship and i hope those of you in life groups have actually experienced this where you, like we hear testimony after testimony about how i was suffering and about how about my friend you know came to my rescue he she suffered alongside with me she shared the same thoughts as me and you realize that your sister is in christ if you are in a life group please make a prayer text room together. And through that text room, when you share prayer requests, when you pray together, see how the Holy Spirit unites your thoughts to have to be in one accord. And if you are not in life group, and if you're looking for real friendship like this, talk to a life group leader. You need to be able to practice real unity in the context of the church. And this is your practice ground. This is where you practice being vulnerable and sharing your life and letting other people share in your life and vice versa. And then in that you see the spiritual unity of God's people. Amen? Verse 24 to 26. So this is the content of their prayer. Usually I would have focused on this more, but I believe um, uh, this part can be a little shorter right now. Verse 24 to 26. Here's what it says. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through David. And so when they heard of it, they lifted their, um, their voices together and they said, Sovereign Lord, who made, the earth and the, uh, who made heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, and then this whole content. And here's what's happening here. Prayer, what prayer helps you to do is not just memorize and understand scripture it helps you see the context of why scripture applies to you right now do you get this so basically when you're praying as the holy spirit reveals his thoughts and his mind to you people suddenly start getting an idea of what god said in the old testament why he said that why is building up to a certain point and why it leads to jesus and the gospel and suddenly you become more aware of the flow the meta story the meta narrative of all scripture a lot of you are just trying to dissect scripture with your mind and your logic and your reasoning is not enough to understand and draw out the deep truths of scripture. But how do you actually digest scripture in a way that actually saves your soul every day? How do you do that? You pray over it. You pray scripture. Do you get this? So, practical point. When something has happened, upon release, for example, when you have a tough situation in your life, don't start by what? what you feel. Here's an example. Father, uh, today someone slapped me. Uh, theoretical, so, okay. Someone slapped me today. Father, my, my face is ringing. This hurts. I'm angry and I focus on my emotions and it's like, my emotions! How could he? How, or she, whoever, right? How could this have happened? How could you let this happen? And suddenly the direction of your prayer is just flinging off into a trajectory that might not need to go there. But then, what is the Holy Spirit telling me? Uh, turn the other cheek. And it suddenly becomes, Jesus, you turn your cheek for me. 
suddenly becomes, now I understand scripture. I understand why you told me that. Suddenly, verses and words start glowing alive in gold color. They start glowing, uh, uh, and you start understanding why God is saying this to you at this context. And so suddenly your prayer is no longer about my circumstances or my emotions. It's about what you promised way before and then how that's happening in my life right now. And I see what? The purpose of that. You're building me. You're sanctifying me. You're giving me hope only in you and not in this world. And suddenly your prayer saves you. Because what? You're praying scripture. A lot of you try to pray scripture, but the, the cold, real truth is you haven't read enough. And so you don't, you don't, the Holy Spirit, one of his biggest roles is to help you remember who Jesus is through scripture, but the, the fact is you don't read the Bible enough. And so here's the thing read scripture, pray over it, read scripture, pray over it, and gradually you will have verses and concepts and beliefs that come to mind as the Spirit shines it upon you. He illumines what you need to pray. And that's why prayer is so hard for a lot of you because you start where? Internally. Emotions, what I feel, what my circumstances. It's a good place to start. But if scripture isn't being relied upon, then how are you going to interpret your situation? Unless subjectively, right? Repeat after me. Lord, help me remember your word when I pray. Amen? Pray scripture. Don't start from here. Don't start from here. Start from here. It needs to be objective to you, to be real truth. Okay? Okay, next. Then verse 26 through 27. It says, against his anointed one. So he's talking about Jesus and everything that's hap happening because of God's sovereignty. And then verse 27. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to persecute. To do what? In verse 28, to do whatever your hand has predestined. So here's what a biblical understanding that trusts in what? The sovereign God. Here's what that prayer is doing. It helps them trust in God right now so that they can prepare for the future. Do you get this? Why are they talking about the persecution and the death of Jesus, his anointed one? Why? Because Jesus is the culmination point of where all of God's promises are leading. And then now that they see this pattern where they see God wearing flesh, becoming humbled, becoming a servant, and then dying upon the cross, this downward mobilization. Once they see that and they know it's the way to follow their, their mentor and their leader and their savior, here's what's happening. They apply it and they say, wait, sovereign God, you who, what? made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, including the Sanhedrin, including the Jewish leaders, including the teachers of the law who just told us, you will not speak in that name any, anymore. Then they remember, you made them and you allowed them to kill your son and yet your will still lives in this world and is, is still doing your gospel work. And so what are they doing through this? God's promise will keep me afloat when I still preach and continue to preach God's word. And what is this? Living trust. By your hand, what you predestined to do, what you have planned out perfectly, will happen and I need not fear. No need for that committee to talk about the best legal way to do it. Now what do I focus on? Obedience. Because you're perfectly in control. Because you have a, a will that you planned before creation, that you fulfilled in Christ already, and all that I have to do now is trust in you. Those who pray, in other words, those who pray, they remember scripture, they see the gospel, the flow of the gospel, and then what happens? They develop living trust for today. A lot of us, because we're in a Reformed background, a lot of you are really good at praying scripture. And a lot of you end up praying, uh, I've heard you pray, you pray good theology. So you're like, you sovereign God created the heaven and the earth. And that's the way they start this, it's wonderful. But you don't know how to make it touch down on where you are right now. You're sovereign, you're beautiful, you're powerful, but what about that angry boss right now that I can't seem to get off my back? How does that connect? How does God, a sovereign God, connect with your boss right now, your wife right now, your children right now, your difficult circumstances right now? 
the only way to do that is to form living trust because you see how God has worked throughout all of Scripture. Living trust right now. God fulfilled his promises as he said he will. And then we see the great cost that God paid to fulfill his promise. What is that cost? The cross of Jesus Christ. It's like receiving the greatest gift. It's like receiving a million dollars in down payment for a mortgage. If you receive a million dollars as down payment, how sure is the guarantee that you will continue to finish making those payments? That's the same thing. God gave Jesus to us as a down payment of what he will finally accomplish in all of your lives, although you've already been saved, what he will complete in your lives, and you become certain he will finish. He will finish this process. He will make me more like Christ. He will keep his promises. That is the living faith that a lot of us need right now. Living trust. Active, day-to-day trust. Not a thousand years ago. People who pray know God's track record, and they know his promises will never fail. I hope that you have trust every day. And the only way to get that, pray. Pray. So easy, so easy, but pray. Then verse 29, it says, Enable your servants. Enable your servants. Uh, or it says, Grant to your servants what? Verse 29 says, And now, look, Lord, look upon their heart, uh, their threats and grant to your servants what? To continue to speak your word with all boldness. All boldness. Notice the missing prayers that we often pray. What is it? Father, they threaten me. Father, what if they kill me? Father, I suffered so much for your name. Uh, why am I suffering more? And you see a total lack of what? Circumstantial complaining. Asking for healing because their hearts have been wounded. You don't see that here. Maybe they did. Maybe Luke didn't record it. But if it wasn't recorded, it was for a good purpose. Why? Because they trust in God so much that their circumstances is taken care of. They know. Their hearts and their healing. The issues that they have to go through psychologically. I trust in God. It will happen. And so what is therefore the conclusion? What I can do? What is it? Obedience. Give me courage to obey you one more day despite the circumstances. And that is what prayer does. It gives you what? Kingdom focus. If God's kingdom is so hard to pursue, it's because you haven't been praying. You haven't seen God's faithfulness and his, and his trustworthiness, and therefore you always worry about your life. But God says, hey, leave that unto me. Those who pray will have a kingdom focus. You'll, your life will be crystal clear. Enable your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. Every day, as you're praying, God will take care of the circumstance that you're talking about. God will take care of the struggle that you're going through. But what are you asking for? Just for that to conclude? Just for that struggle to be over with? Or are you asking for faith to obey? That only comes when you're praying and you know that God is taking care of you. Verse 31. The place where they met, last verse, the place where they met was shaken and they were what? All filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, those who pray receive continued fillings of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, doctrinally, you have to know this. This is not the original salvific uh, filling of the Holy Spirit that's first given. This is what? A renewal, a refreshing of the Holy Spirit that continues to give you power. A lot of you were saved. You know you have the Holy Spirit inside you, but it's just such a small thing in your life that he's not filling your hearts with power and activism. But here's the thing. When you pray, you know the gospel flow. You know the Old Testament history culminating in Jesus Christ and how that leads to your obedience. When you know all of that, when you pray to do God's will, see if he will not fill you with the Holy Spirit. And this might sound a little too theoretical, so let's, let's make this a lot more earthly. Um, so my, my daughter, Ilya, uh, I always look to her for uh, illustrations now. <laughs> she loves these uh, grape-flavored candies, and I only give that to her in, in the car. And so as we were going down from my house to the first floor underground, um, and she was, you know, crying and fussing to ask for that great uh, flavored candy. 
So she was crying and crying, and we get down to the car, and then I shake that uh, 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 the container. It only had one piece of candy left. So it's like, oh, you go, okay, this is your last piece, and so I'll give it to you. And so I give it to her, and then she opens it up, and she finds there's there's only one. And so she's like, yes, I finally have it. And then she was, you know, still crying. And she had been crying. Her face was all red. But then she holds that piece of candy. She looks at it. She looks at me. She looks at it. She's like, "아빠 먹을래?" <laughs> and that made my day in so many different ways. Why? Why? And let's look at the principle behind of this. She wanted that so much. That would make her day. That was what she was crying for the whole time. But when she noticed that I was also a person, <laughs> right? And when she noticed that I, was, I could also want that candy, she was like, do you want this, Daddy? And I kissed her a thousand times. I just fell in love with her all over again. And I could buy a million pieces of candies for myself, and I would still not be happy. But when seeing that piece of candy in her hand, those grubby little fingers, they're so beautiful. And that drives parents insane. The fact that your child thought of your wishes and your will before he thought of their own circumstances. And that's what God does. Father, I'm hurting, I'm suffering. I want this pain to go away. I want this issue to be done with. But may your will be done. Give me courage to proclaim your word even though my life is suffering. And God who listens, this kind of prayer, it doesn't just, it says where they gather was shaken. But it's not where they gather that was shaken. You got to know this. The place that was shaken wasn't the gates of hell. It wasn't the place that they were gathering. What was shaken was God's heart. God's heart was shaken by a people who, who were suffering and still wanted to do his will. And that caused him to what? Dance upon his throne. That caused him to pour out what he could offer, the best of what he could offer. What was that? Himself. That's why this leads to what? The giving of the Holy Spirit. You did this. When you were suffering the most, you still desired my kingdom. Now have what, I, what is most dear to me, my son, myself, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the triune God working in your life, I give you myself. That's what you need. You need God. And he pours himself out amongst you. But here's the only question I have. Why did he pour himself out for us, people like me? I went to uh, Kentucky on Thursday, and I, was, I, I had an important exam the next day. Laid down in bed at 8, 8 p.m., and then I couldn't fall asleep until 3 a.m., and I know God wanted to talk to me. I was dead tired, but God wanted to talk to me. And so I was thinking, God, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want, want, me to, what, what do you want to say to me right now? And as I was praying, I remembered suddenly the, the voice of my mom. She was saying, uh, David, when you were young, you know when we went to Lake Travis in Austin, uh, you really wanted to ride a boat, but we didn't have a boat, obviously, because we only came to America with $500. But you were praying that you wanted to ride on a boat. And suddenly this rich white couple, they stopped their boat right in front of us uh, the second you finished that prayer, and they invited us on their boat. And we started riding that boat. And that, that, that story just came to mind. And then the first thing that came out of my mouth was, and this was, this was when I was six years old. So 30 years ago, 30 years of unprocessed Thanksgiving here, I said, Lord, thanks for sending that boat. Then suddenly, next four hours, prayer comes out. Prayer comes out. Thank you for uh, the first time I held the table tennis racket. Thank you for the first time that I met a real good friend. Thanks for the first time that you showed your love to me through my parents. Thanks for the first time that this happened. And all of these pent up thanksgiving started coming out. And then I realized God thought of me as his son. Because we're his children. Why does God give this to us? Because Jesus, whenever he prayed, all the things that he could receive from his Father, he gave it unto us. Perfect intimacy, fullness of the Spirit, power and wisdom and courage, all the things that Jesus, as the Son of God, received upon his knees, he gave that upon us. He achieved that for us, and he gave it to us. What does that tell us about our status? That we are beloved sons and daughters, even though we are so messy. We people who don't want to pray 10 minutes a day, 
We rebel rebels who think that praying five minutes a day is a chore and you want to get over it and you want to stop having that time. It's such a burden to QT every day. Because God sees us as his children. And that should astound you and alarm your senses. God sees you as his children. And he pours out everything to us. The gospel is the foundation of why we can pray. Because Jesus traded places with us. And he calls us, daughter, I love you. Son, I love you. Remember when I did this? Remember this? Remember this? All your life is culminating by a process of my love unto you. And you see all the major building blocks of what made you, you? That's my grace because I love you. Who wouldn't pray after knowing God's heart like this? Who wouldn't want to live for God and ask for courage to love him better after knowing a heart like this? Therefore, the greatest blessing I can give you right now, people pray. And the life that you've been missing out on, the intimacy that you've been missing out on, the community that you've been missing out on, the purpose and the drive of life that you've been missing out on, the adventure of life that you've been missing out on, it's all there because you're children of God. Don't you want to pray now? Everything comes through that. The engine that we've been missing, it comes through that. Simple application. People, pray. Amen? Pray day in and day out. When you wake up, nighttime prayer, walking prayer, bus time prayer, ignoring your friend in a conversation prayer. <laughs> All types of prayer are valid. Pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father,